Hello there. If you happen to be around in the last century, and I was, you might recall that I gave a talk on the 23rd Psalm. I believe I called it something like uh, the 23rd Psalm in the 20th century. Well, here we are in the 21st century. And guess what? We're still relying on the 23rd Psalm because it hasn't changed and nothing about it has changed. Why talk about the 23rd Psalm anyway? Doesn't everyone know everything about sheep and shepherds? Maybe, and maybe not. So let's talk about it for a while. Because my husband was a school superintendent, we would take hundreds of teenagers to Europe on work-study vacations in the summer, and we would bring our three children along with them. One noon, we found ourselves on the Matterhorn, looking out over a, a beautiful meadow, and I saw the most interesting thing a man with a group of sheep, a herd of sheep, a flock of sheep, whatever you call a group of sheep. And he, he was interesting to study because you would think he was totally unaware of their presence. And you would think they were totally unaware of his presence, but um, they were each well aware of each other. He was uh, sitting there in the, in the grass uh, eating his lunch, and they were eating their lunch, but their eyes were always on each other. You know, there was something beautiful about that, to be on the Matterhorn, to see a shepherd, see the sheep, and have a little girl named Heidi. There was almost like a Walt Disney movie. But the most memorable part of it was him, a man, all of a sudden taking care of it. I, I, I turned to Heidi, and I, it was such a mo moment. I said, Heidi, Heidi, this is a shepherd. Do you know what a shepherd is? And she looked at me with one of those eye rolls we do get as parents. No, I can't believe you asked me such a question. Yes, mother. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, well, I've had plenty of eye rolls since then, but that was one of the first. The Lord is my shepherd. And the Lord is your shepherd. A simple, emphatic statement made by David centuries ago. Still true today. The Lord is my shepherd, not just a sheep's shepherd, not just David's shepherd, not just a 2,000 year ago shepherd, but there on that Swiss mountainside, the Lord was her shepherd. And here now, the Lord is your shepherd, our shepherd. Think what it means to a sheep to have a shepherd. It means that every need is met. Think what it means to you to have a shepherd. It means every need is met. When David wrote the 23rd Psalm, he plugged into it the answer to every human need. And before this hour ends, my prayer is that you find an answer to the question you have in the confines of the 23rd Psalm. So let's begin. You know it, but let's review it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to take this psalm apart, verse by verse. So here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. So he knew who, who needs a shepherd? I mean, I, I've, got, I've got a pediatrician for my early needs, Medicare for my later ones, and Clearasil and facelifts in between. So who needs a shepherd? Well, when things are going well, 
we make the mistake of thinking we don't when things are going well until Black Monday hits or Blue Monday or until I'm alone and I, I don't know where to turn and the world has, has, has run out of answers and I need help. I need a shepherd. I need God. We all do. The God David turned to and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and, and the Shunammite and Elijah and Moses. Christ Jesus recognized the futility of trying to make it without a shepherd. Mark tells us, and I quote, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, unquote. We're going to review some of those things now, remind ourselves of what it means to have a shepherd and how we can be better sheep. Sheep know their shepherd's call. Whether he summons them with a whistle or his voice, they know their shepherd and they come to him. I'm told you could have 5,000 sheep on a hillside and 500 different shepherds, but when a shepherd calls his sheep, they come. They cut from the crowd and they come. They don't come to other shepherds. No matter how loud the, the other shepherds call, they come only to their own. They pick up no mixed messages. They don't follow the crowd. They follow their shepherd. And as long as that sheep lives, its needs will be met. So long as it gives to its shepherd that which every shepherd demands of every sheep, absolute obedience. Yet here we are, educated men and women boasting of our thinking powers and reasoning processes that there are not many of us who will trust God Almighty half as much as that dumb sheep trusts its shepherd. The difference between smart, sophisticated men and a poor, dumb animal is that the animal instinctively knows that he needs a shepherd. And we keep thinking we can make it on our own. And we can. I'd like to share something about this kind of shepherding. It was written by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy, the founder and discoverer of Christian science. I refer to her in gratitude because without her, we wouldn't have Christian science. A religion, a, a way of life, of thinking, that has opened up the teachings of the Bible to millions of people and made those teachings practical and usable in their daily lives. We're very grateful to that enlightened lady who helped to liberate mankind before women themselves were supposed to be liberated. We admire her, we thank her, but we don't worship her. We don't worship Thomas Edison either, but we're mighty grateful for electricity it's made a profound difference in our lives and even in our ability to communicate right now. He didn't create it, but without him and what he discovered, life would be pretty dim. It's nice to have a technology along the way which began with the discovery of electricity and the work of Thomas Edison. I've often thought that if I had a choice in my life between electricity and Christian science, I choose the latter. Well, anyway, back, back to something Mary Baker Eddy wrote. It's a hymn which begins, Shepherd, show me how to go, or the hillside steep, how to gather, how to sow, how to feed thy sheep. I will listen for thy voice, lest my footsteps stray. I will follow and rejoice all the rugged way. There are four very sheepish things asked of us in that poem. The first is, shepherd, show me how to go. Not, I'll show you, but, Lord, show me. It's not, listen, Lord, for thy servant speaketh, but, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. I wonder how many people actually do this, actually ask God what to do. You see, we're prone to ask our relatives, our friends, our doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, whoever, but not God. 
Even good card-carrying Christian scientists sometimes let this one drop through the cracks, and we don't ask God what to do, when to do it, how to do it. But that's only the first step. Once we do that, we need to move on to the second. I will listen for thy voice, not for all the other voices, yours. I'll listen for your whistle above the crowd, God, lest my footsteps stray. That's why we listen, isn't it? We don't want our footsteps to stray. We don't want to make a wrong move. We don't listen because we're dumb animals. We listen because we're wise enough to know it's in our best interest. So easy to get lost otherwise. Now, when, when you narrow down John Q. Public to, to those who actually ask God what to do and then narrow that down to those who are willing to stop and listen, you've got a pretty small crowd on your hands. Jesus was a listener. We sometimes ask and then do our own thing. We don't, we don't take the quiet time to listen because we're so busy talking. Remember the reference of, uh, of this in Matthew, quote, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Even the needed time to listen, to get set with God. We need to listen. An early Christian scientist, her name was Julia Johnston, was once asked by a newspaper reporter what she thought was our greatest need. Oh, she said, that's easy. It's to listen. To listen it's revelation. Not to listen is revolution. Listen for those angel messages. You'll hear them. Mrs. Eddy describes them as when a lion roareth. And, and understand that when a lion roars in the jungle, no other sound can be heard. And in case you think that you're not spiritually minded enough to hear God, I'm going to tell you a story about that a little bit later. And so we ask and we listen, and then step three, I will follow. Now we've really narrowed our group down, haven't we? We had those who, who were willing to ask God what to do, then the few who actually listened for the answer, and now we're really down to the remnants of Gideon, those who will actually follow. You see, sometimes we ask the shepherd what to do, and then we listen, but we don't like what we hear. And instead of following, we argue back a little bit with, hey, hey, shepherd, that wasn't what I had in mind. And can't you hear that answer? No. It's what I had in mind. So now we're really being sheepish. We've asked, we've listened, we've followed. And now comes the really tough one. We're asked to rejoice all the rugged way. It's easy to rejoice when everything's cushy, but when the way is rugged, woof. A Sunday school student once asked his teacher why, if he's asked, he's listened, he's followed, why would the way be rugged? The teacher didn't have the answer, but one of the other kids did. He said, hey, I climb mountains. If I were to try to climb a smooth mountain, I wouldn't have anything to hold on to. He said, I rely on those little toe holes, those places to hold on to. Well, of course, that's true in our life as well, isn't it? When things get tough, it's really good to take a moment and look back on even tougher times and what prayer got you out of. Those rough spots, they serve as inspiration when you need it. And you know what's a good idea? Keep a record of your answered prayers. They'll encourage you when a new need arises. Listen for those angel messages. You'll hear them. You know, it's one thing to ask, another to listen, another to follow, but another to rejoice when the way gets rugged. And that's what we just discussed, isn't it? And that's what we're going to remember to do. That's what helps us keep our joy when we're on that path. Because in following the shepherd, we have so many beautiful promises. One of which is, coming up here, I shall not want. You see, the bottom line is that you and I don't need God as our shepherd unless, of course, we want our needs met, and we do. I, I used to think that this psalm meant that 
I would have everything I wanted if I followed my shepherd. But it isn't want here. It's need. This psalm speaks to I shall not lack or be in need or be in want. And that's quite a promise, isn't it? Especially in this economy. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not need. I shall not be in lack if I follow my shepherd. In the Christian Science textbook, which is called Science and Health, with key to the scriptures, I have a copy of it here, Mrs. Eddy says, Divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. Not every human want. Every human need. But, but we argue, I mean, what if? What if my need is, is very great? I mean, what if my problem has grown too big? Too big for what? For God? Says who? <laughs> Jesus? The man who worked the greatest miracles the world has ever seen actually said, greater works than these shall ye do because I go unto my Father. Greater works than this? That's what he was telling us. Because he went to God. Remember? He went to God. If we don't, well, then we can't begin to imagine his works. You know, this business of little need, big need was brought home to me at one time when I was a little kid and evidently was very bothered about something. And my dad asked me what my problem was. And I said, I I just don't know what to do. And he said, have you asked God? Well, I said, Dad, I can't ask God about this. It's too little. He said, too little. I wouldn't pick out a necktie without asking God first. And I looked at him. He's a pretty sharp dresser. And I realized he was trying to tell me something really important. There's no problem too little, and there's no problem too big. Well, what would you do if you were told you had a big problem? An incurable disease. Leprosy was a so-called incurable disease, which Jesus dealt with. Would you do what the master did? Would you go to God? Most people wouldn't even go to God to remove a wart. Or what if you were born blind, as were several who came to Jesus? Would you go to God, as he did, for help with blindness? Most of us wouldn't even trust him with an eye irritation. Or what if you had... um, 5,000 men plus women and children drop in for dinner. Would you go to God or Costco? Let me tell you the story of a guy who decided to go to God with a problem. Now, this guy had less history in Christian science than anyone, I can guarantee you, who is listening to this talk. I had met a kid named Don... We were both 17 years old at a frat party on Saturday night. I invited him to go to Sunday school with me the following morning, which he did. And then he stayed over for church, and he loved it. He said, I'd never heard of Christian science. This is the truth. I love this. And uh, at, at that time in my life, helping to work my way through college, I was a disc jockey at the local commercial station. So the only time I can talk to anyone is when a record is playing. And for those who are not of my genre, a record was a round black thing with a hole in the middle and you put a needle on it and it played music. But at any rate, while a record was playing, I got a call from the emergency wing of our local hospital and they put Don on the phone. He said, I have had a rather bad injury. He was out with his fraternity on some silly thing, and he tripped on something and mangled a part of his hand, one of his fingers. And uh, they had insisted he go to the hospital, and the hospital had taken x-rays, and they had just given him the result of the x-rays. They said, because this, this finger was mutilated beyond all help, we can do nothing. The bone is gone. There's, there's nothing there that we can rebuild. It's shattered. So here's what we will do. He said, they said, we'll put a cast on your hand. It will go from the end of your hand, your hand of your fingers, to your shoulder. We'll keep that cast on for six weeks. That's tough when you're in college and you've got to write things. But at any rate, they said at the end of six weeks, come back. We will re-examine, re-x-ray, 
and see if something there can be salvaged. So he said, could I please come over to your house tomorrow night and would you heal it? I said, pardon? He said, heal it. Oh, I, I would no, have no, I, I, he said, did I misunderstand? I thought Christian science was about healing. Well, I said, yes, it is. But so he said, I'll come over tomorrow night and just explain Christian science to me, if you would. Oh, wow. I really had to go through my own mental anthology there for a moment to think, I've, I've been in this all my life, but how can I explain it to him? And then I decided that I had to start it with Genesis 1. Because in Genesis 1, and I think most of you believe in the Old Testament, in Genesis 1 we're we're told that man was created in God's own likeness. And I believed that, Genesis 1. But then you think, but what's God's likeness? Is it the guy on the on the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo painted with the, you know, the white hair? And no, no, that can't be. We can't all be the image and likeness of this man. So I looked it up in the Bible to see what the New Testament told me about just what God was. John 4, 24 said, Jesus said, God is a spirit. Wait a minute. If man is his image and likeness, and God is a spirit, wouldn't that make man spiritual and not material? And then is he subject to material conditions? That's a huge jump, isn't it? But that is Christian science. In fact, if you ever visit a Christian science church on Sunday morning, every, every sermon, if you'll call it that, ends with man is not material. He is spiritual. So I thought, I will try to explain that. So Don came over to the house, and, and we probably spent seven or eight minutes. I told him exactly what I just told you, and he went back to his frat house, and the next morning, I saw him on campus, and he waved, and I thought, something's wrong with this picture. What's happened? Wait a minute. He doesn't have a cast on. So when he got closer, I said, where's your cast? He said, I took it off. I said, why did you do that? He said, Genesis 1, remember? Well, I said, yeah, I, uh, can I, can I? How did you get it off? He said, with a saw. I said, can I see your hand? He said, yeah. Look at your fingers. Pick things up. It was absolute perfection. He said, Mona, that's Genesis 1. And here, here he was as a total newcomer who simply had, he took it in. He believed it. He understood it. Some of us students, we still don't quite understand it. It's a pretty big jump, isn't it? A poem was written about it, which I dearly love. It begins with, um, which of these men do you think of as you? Genesis 1 or Genesis 2? Do you know what's what? Do you know who's who? In Genesis 1, in the 26th verse, there's a man with never a taint of a curse. But in Genesis 2, verse number 7, There's a dust man conceived. He'll never see heaven. So it all boils down to which one you claim. What thou seest, thou beest. So what is your name? If you're Genesis 1, then you know what you're worth. For according to law, you will inherit the earth. But if you're just a mortal and made out of dust, is there anything to you that's worthy of trust? No. The thing they call man in Genesis 2 is the dream of the dreamer. Never was you. So know who you are. Take your place in the sun. You're the immortal man of Genesis 1. We talk following Christ Jesus. We talk trusting God. But as a people, we don't practice what we preach. Interesting that In a nation that prints in God we trust on its money, you could get prosecuted and ridiculed for doing so, but that's beside the point. Jesus was telling us to go to the Father, go to God, and we're going everywhere else, aren't we? The world is searching frantically for help when he's right there within reach. 
The Old Testament told us of the help available, gave us promises and rules to live by, the Ten Commandments, the 23rd Psalm, etc., but we needed more. We needed proof that what we were told worked, and we got it in the New Testament with the arrival of Jesus. He showed us how our needs could be met by his works, and he explained them with his words. And when he left, society remembered him, but they didn't follow him. You remember what he commanded? That we heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Instead, we're drugging the sick, forgetting life is eternal, isolating the lepers, and fearing the demons. We've allowed each to intimidate us. We've empowered them. The study of Christian science makes it clear that, quote, error comes to you for life and you give it all the life it has, unquote. Jesus' words rang through the centuries, but his works were not replicated. People didn't heal and cleanse and raise and cast out, probably not because they didn't want to, but because they didn't know how. Enter Christian science, which explains how, how every need can be met, how no need is too great, or too small. Remember my dad's necktie story? He was telling me that no problem was too little to take to God. Do you have a problem that's too big? Now, who told you it was too big? Did God tell you? Let me share another story about that. When I was a little kid, I heard a testimony by a former World War II officer. He and his company got caught behind the German lines, and they were hiding in a foxhole, and they were discovered. And the German officer issued the command for all of them to be killed. So they started at the far end of the foxhole and shot all of his men, and he was at the other end. And as the guns came toward him, the thought came, I'm going to die. And then a question came to him. Did God tell you that? He thought, no, God didn't, but common sense. If God didn't say it, it didn't get said. The German officer halted the guns and said in German, and my friend, or the person I wasn't my friend, I was a stranger, said, uh, I knew enough German to know what the officer said. He said, stop, they're all dead. And he turned around and looked at me. And we locked eyes. And then he told them all to leave. He was at the end of the line. He turned around and once again he said, we exchanged glances. He knew I was alive. I leave you with that interesting question, possibly to ask yourself about something you're struggling with. Did God tell you that? So, back to the big problem, little problem dilemma. In Genesis, we have a story of a talking serpent. In Revelation, a story of a great red dragon. One little, one big. Both made of the same flimsy substance. Is one more frightening than the other. For the rest of this hour, could you entertain just the possibility that the Lord really is your shepherd right now and that your every need could be met by that shepherd? And then then let's explore with one more concept. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The shepherd makes sure that his sheep are fed with rich green grass. And he scouts out surrounding pastures to find the best ones, sometimes getting up as early as 3.30 in the morning to scout. He gets them there too. That's one of our needs, isn't it? A green pasture. It symbolizes to me being in our right place, the place that meets our needs at that moment, the right marriage, the right job, the right 
housing situation, the right answer you need right now. Your green pasture may not be mine. We all have our pastures and we want to be in our right one. We don't, we don't want to make a mistake. Polls say, and this is interesting, that mankind's greatest fear is the fear of making a mistake. This psalm speaks to that, doesn't it? It says, he's going to make you get to that green pasture. And what if you jump the fence? What if you blow it and you go to the wrong place and make the wrong move? He'll get you back. By hook or by crook, he'll get you back. And, and what if you drag your feet and you don't go to that green pasture? He'll get you there. Trust him. That's why that shepherd's rod has a curved hook on the end to get you right around the neck and carry you there, drag you there when you need to be dragged. And there's something else to that green pasture verse, which is sometimes called the rest and relaxation part of the entire psalm. It speaks to man's need for a sense of peace. You see, those who study the habits of the sheep say that a sheep won't lie down until it's free of fear. You know what that tells you? That God is not only going to get you to your right place, he's going to make you feel good about being there. It's a promise of freedom from fear, from uneasiness about where you are and what you're doing. Because deep down inside, you trust the shepherd who brought you there. He doesn't suggest that you lie down in a green pasture. He makes you. And he makes you lie down in it, not roam around restless and confused and disenchanted. And he doesn't make you lie down in a parched, scorched, arid pasture. That loving shepherd of yours makes you lie down in a green one. Can you accept that promise as a possibility for you? Then, then try out this next one. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Why? Why would she need a, to be beside a still water? Oh, a simple reason. He would die if he wasn't beside still water. You see, he can't drink from running water. He's afraid of it because his wool is so heavy that he could be carried downstream quite easily if he were to be caught in the water. It, it's his unique need, and, and, and the shepherd knows it. And the shepherd makes sure that that sheep has still water. Dogs can drink from running water. Horses can, but sheep can't. It's their own unique need. You know what they're doing. They're standing right on the edge of that running water. And if they're in the mud and the water's coming and it's very easy to get swept into the stream. It doesn't matter if you can swim. But if you have heavy wool and you can't, then you have to have something better for you, don't you? So here's what the shepherd does. He creates the still water for them. He, he digs a little hole kind of close to the running water. And then he, with his rod, his staff, he then digs a bit of a trench from the, from the running water to the still water. And all of a sudden now, he's got a little pond of still water for his sheep. The sheep's need is met. You may be uh, hearing this talk next to a person in this world that you're closer to than anyone else or you may be sitting beside a stranger. But either way, your need is uniquely different from theirs. Like that, like that sheep's need is very different, very unique. It's a still water need. Back to the shepherd. What does he do about that still water need? He seeks it out for them. He creates it. He goes to the stream, as I've said, and he makes sure that it's provided. And then the, the sheep does something too. He stand, the sheep is standing by, always waiting, always trusting that shepherd. It's a tender picture, isn't it? A big manly shepherd kneeling beside a stream, making an earthen dam with his hands so that his sheep can have that still water they need. And then he calls them to him, and they come. As I said, they know their shepherd's voice. And another interesting point, they stay close by. That's not a bad idea either. He leadeth me beside the still waters, David said. Me, you, us. We're not talking sheep now. We're talking us now. 
Can you trust that the need you feel is so unique and so private and so desperate is known by God? And can you trust God to meet that need? The sheep have their still water provided them, their unique need provided, but they have, they have two things they do. Again, two things we need to do. Number one, they expect the shepherd to meet that need. Number two, they follow. A sheep expects the water to be there. If he didn't expect his need to be met, he wouldn't be listening for the shepherd's call and he wouldn't follow, and then his still water needs wouldn't be met, not because of the shepherd, but because of the sheep. If your needs are not being met, I have a question for you. Do you expect them to be? When Heidi, our youngest one, was again around three years old, um, we had a, a little habit in our family that just as the children were going to bed and cuddled up in their bed, we went to their rooms and asked them to share a thought, a good thought with us. And one night I went into Heidi's room and I said, Heidi, it's time for your thought. And she said, I don't have one. Well, knowing that's possibly punishable by death, she thought about that for a while. And then in about five minutes, she called, I have it, I have it. So I went into her room and I said, well, let's hear it, Heidi. And she said very earnestly, I pray and I pray, and the darkness goes away. And I said, Heidi, that's a beautiful thought. I really do like that. It says a lot about hope, about trust, about expectancy. And you did say, I pray and I pray. You didn't say, well, I pray and it didn't work. You kept praying. You're staying with it. Besides, you also called a problem darkness. It'll never be more than that. It's always simply going to be the absence of light, and that's all it is. So I said goodnight to her, started to turn off the light, and she said, wait, wait a minute. If it's that good, send it to the Sentinel. The Christian Science Sentinel is our weekly magazine. I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to do that, Heidi. That'll be fine, sure. Oh, mother, mother. If, if they print it, split the check. Well, at that time, they were paying for poems, and for a period of time, they, they may, I don't know, but we had to split the check. Anyway, I, I, I wrote it up for the Sentinel, and it, wrote, it uh, came out as, I pray and I pray and the darkness goes away, said my child. That's a childlike thought. The darkness flees after prayer. But it says a lot about trust, about hope, about expectancy, tell me something. When you pray, do you know that the darkness will go away? God knows your still water needs, knows how to meet them, and he'll call you when your still water is ready. You just be listening for the call. You will be if you expect it. Are you afraid you might not recognize the whistle? Afraid you might recognize your shepherd's voice? That when God directs you, you, you won't know whether it's his direction or something you've conjured up in your own mind? Do you think that you have to be a spiritual genius to hear God's voice? Oh, God speaks to us in a way we can understand. I have another Heidi story for you. One morning we smelled um, a fire in the house somewhere. We jumped out of bed and wow, it was coming from Heidi's room. Again, she was a tiny little thing and and uh, we went in there, and her electric blanket had become defective. So we, we looked quickly and saw that the blanket had burned and the sheets, but she was fine. She was sound asleep, cuddled up on the pillow. We woke her up, and we said, Heidi, Heidi, this is you, you have so much to be grateful for. We are so grateful. You had to be listening to God's voice last night because look at that. You're, look what happened to your bed. But you, you crawled up on the pillow and fell asleep. She said, yes, I did. I remember what he said. What? You remember what God said? What did he say? She looked at me with those big blue eyes and she, very earnestly, and she said, God said, Heidi, your feet are getting hot. What I'm trying to tell you is a message from God is not always within many, many syllables. You can trust your shepherd to tell when you 
you tell you when your feet are getting hot. You can trust your shepherd to lead you to your still water, to meet your unique needs. And you can trust him to restore what you think that you've lost because the next stanza is, he restoreth my soul, which translates, he brings me back to my unimpaired condition. You know, when uh, David wrote the 23rd Psalm, he said he was going to plug into it the answer to anything. And this, those four words, were going to be the answer to healing. He restoreth my soul, which translates, he restores my spiritual sense. This is a psalm which is called the healing psalm. These words are translated, he brings me back to my unimpaired condition. Now, note what the sheep do for the restoration process, what their part of it is, for they do indeed do something for their restoration. Each day, they go to their shepherd for a brief moment, and the shepherd whispers in their ear. Now you understand, the research I've done on all of this is based more on the Middle Eastern shepherding customs. I don't know that an American shepherd would whisper in a sheep's ear. California sheep may listen to iPods, I don't know. But at any rate, over there, the sheep go to their shepherd daily for a moment. They, uh, it's in an interesting thing, they, this, is, this is how it happens. They say that uh, the researchers who've watched it say the shepherd at a certain time of the day, mid-afternoon usually, is standing alone. A sheep comes up to them. The shepherd leans down and embraces the sheep and whispers in his ear. And when the whisper is over, the sheep run away. And the next one comes up. They wait their turn. The researcher asks, what is it you whisper? And he said, that's a secret. Well, he said, would you do this for me just for research? Would you, when the sheep comes up there, instead of welcoming the sheep, as you do, you lean out, would you just stand there, folded arms, and look away? He said, well, the sheep is there? Yes, just please, just for research. So the shepherd agrees to do it. He stands there, the sheep comes up, looks very quizzically, like, what's going on? And then the sheep, he said, began to circle and circle and circle the shepherd, and then began to bleat, to cry. Shepherd looked at the researcher and said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he leaned down and embraced the sheep, whispered in his ear, and the sheep went on. He couldn't let the sheep go without that special moment. So the sheep go to their shepherd daily for restoration, for love and comfort and attention, not just when they're in trouble, daily. They have an inner need to go to their shepherd each day for restoration, and so do we. How important is it to do that? Not to let anything or anyone come between us and our, our time with our shepherd? Our quiet communion time with God. He restoreth my soul, has also been interpreted. He restoreth the wayward, the injured, the diseased. Needing restoration, fellow sheep? Are you going to your shepherd daily? Are you trusting him to restore you? He will, you know. No matter what your need right now, be you wayward, injured, or diseased, or all of the above, your shepherd can restore you. How? Huh? Oh, I'd like to give you an example of an injured sheep restored. One night I heard a cry in our house, just one word, mother. I thought it must have been the television set or something. So I... But I did run out into the hall, and I found our daughter, Tanya, then a college student, lying absolutely stiff on the floor. Her eyes were glazed, and the first thing and the last thing she said was, I can't see. So she had lost her vision, her ability to move, and then her voice. I called her dad and her brother, Marshall, and they ran upstairs, and picked her up and placed her in bed. Absolutely, as I said, Steve. In fact, I remember her dad 
tried to move her index finger, and he could not move it. We called for help from a Christian science practitioner. That's someone who who helps you in a moment of, of trouble. And then all three of us got to work praying. I remember the night like it was yesterday. I was at the foot of her bed with my books, my Bible, my science and health, and praying. And uh, she had two beanbag chairs, one on, on one side of her bed, one on the other. Her dad was over here. Her brother, Marshall, was over here. At 3 in the morning, I said, you guys, you better go on to bed. You've got to go to your office. You've got to go on to college. And uh, let me stay here. You need your sleep. I kept on studying, and I remember at 6.30 in the morning, I happened to look up again, and they were still there. They wouldn't leave her side. And I was so grateful for that sense of uh, family togetherness, I must admit. When Tanya woke up at her regular time, she woke up completely healed. You see, at that moment, when this struck, we needed the best physician available. So we turned to God. We didn't even consider another alternative. Five generations of Christian science in our family supported that decision. There is a statement in Science and Health that reads, there is no metastasis, no stoppage of harmonious action, no paralysis, unquote. And I worked with that a bit. It takes a quantum leap in thinking to accept that because it involves jumping over everything that seems so real and powerful. It must be the kind of thinking Jesus did when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He didn't start with matter, pumping a heart, filling collapsed lungs with air. He didn't see matter as having the power to kill or to cure. He went straight to God. He saw a God of infinite power, and he trusted him, and so did we. Our first recourse in an emergency, in a problem of any kind, is to turn to God. If our need hadn't been met, we would have been totally free to do whatever we wanted to do. I would assume that a a call to the paramedics would have been step number two, had it been necessary. But step number one, a call to our shepherd, took care of it. Mrs. Eddy once said, and I quote, wisdom in human action begins with what is nearest right under the circumstances and thence achieves the absolute, unquote. I think everyone has the right to determine what is nearest right under his own circumstances without being judged by anyone else. If my friends from other churches feel that their highest right is to get outside help first, I would never dream of criticizing them for that. And I hope that they would never criticize me for turning to God first. Sorry to inundate you with uh, family stories, but uh, when Heidi was a a brownie scout, she brought home a little box from a meeting one day, a box with uh, a red cross on the top and bandages inside, and she said they'd made them in brownies and that they had the funniest name she had ever heard. I said, why? What did they call them? She said, oh my, you won't believe it. They call those first aid kits. Well, I said, honey, that's, that's their name. She said, mother, those are second aid kits. God is our first aid. God is the Christian sign as first aid. Can you begin to see that restoration of whatever needs restoring in your life is possible? Did you ever think of the stake God has in your restoration? In your taking the right path? That's why the next stanza... He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. A shepherd's job rests upon his reputation. If he returns to the village with an injured sheep or a missing sheep, he's not going to get hired again. It's very important to him that he keep his sheep safe from harm, not just for their sake, but for his as well. God wants you to be successful, not just for your sake, but for his as well. You see, you're his representative. You are proof that God exists. You're his image and likeness. Any parent understands this one. A child who does well reflects upon the parent. When your namesake succeeds, it blesses all. And that's why he keeps you on the right path.
for his name's sake. We, we were kept on quite a path one night. We were living at the time in Golden, Colorado. But I decided at the end of the day it would be great fun if I got the children, picked them up from school, stopped at a Christian science reading room, got a copy of a, of a record. You know, those are the round black things with a hole in the middle that we used to use for music. But at any rate, we got the record, Unity of Good, which Mrs. Eddy had written. And I picked the children up from school, and we took off for Kansas after school, so maybe 4 o'clock or so in the afternoon. We didn't have a CD or th anything fancy like that in the car. This was in the early days, you understand. It wasn't a covered wagon. It was a covered Mark IV Lincoln Continental. But at any rate, it didn't have anything fancy in it. So I took our son Marshall's little record player, which was battery operated, and we put it in the front seat, and we put on the records of Unity of Good. Started late afternoon, and now we're driving through a very desolate part of the country, and that's why I kind of wanted the protection of those ideas. Um, about two in the morning, we were driving through either eastern Colorado or western Kansas. They're all, they all kind of blend in and look the same. At any rate, uh, there was no other car on the road, and um, all of a sudden, I thought, what a strange thing. I'm looking at the rearview mirror, and I saw that there was a whole lot of black, heavy smoke from some kind of a fire. And I thought, oh, one of these hay fields or something must be on fire, so we'll just stay on the road and that'll be fine. Except that then I realized it was following us. It was us. It was our car. Well, immediately your thought would be, humanly, pull the car off the road get the doors open, get the children out, and, and run away as far away from the car as you can get. But that wasn't the shepherd's advice. Remember? We follow the shepherd. At that moment, on that record, a line was playing that said, God has mercy on us and guides every event of our career. Well, I thought, well, what do I do, God? Don't I? No. Stay in the car. Keep going. That defied all human logic, but we did it. Unaware that about 100 feet ahead, it was a hill, at the brow of a hill, we got to the top, and oh my, there was an off-ramp from that highway, and off of the ramp was a tiny, tiny little, maybe 8 by 10, filling station. Is that what you call it, a filling station then? And there, were, it, there was a light bulb on in it, and I saw a couple of guys there. I'm sure it was a place to uh, retrofit your, your, your tractors and, and your, your equipment that you needed, but we pulled in, they saw us coming, they ran out with garden hoses, and they put out the problem, and then opened up the car, and within moments, went inside this little shop, which was, they had no storage in there, there was no room for storage, it was really little, but they had a shelf with a little cardboard box in it. And they brought the box out, opened it up, took out a part of the car. They said, this was the problem. This was what caught on fire. Took it out, put the other part in, and they said, that's it. I said, that's it? How, how did you have that one part for a Mark IV Lincoln Continental in your place and nothing else? Well, he said, it's an interesting story. But a few months ago, another Mark IV Lincoln Continental came through from Denver, and it took the guy two weeks waiting here until we could get this part, so I ordered two. Now you know how old the story is because the entire repair in part cost $3, and we headed on to Kansas. He said, now as soon as you get to your destination, go to the Lincoln garage and make sure that the engine hasn't burned up. I didn't even look because of course it hadn't. God has mercy on us and guides every event of our careers. Trust him to lead you in the right path. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's an interesting story about the valley of the shadow of death. That is the name of the valley. It's in Jericho. 
and it's it's not that it's some place where everyone dies and I, in any rate it's simply dark and it's gotten that name because it's dark if you can picture it this is really a rough kind of a picture if you had two really high gorges or mountains uh, to your right and to your left and they were so high that they shielded much of the sun so it was very very dark that's why it's called the shadow of death it's just very dark but it's not dangerous except for one little thing. There is a path through it that the sheep take. And in the middle of the path, there is, I'll just call it a hole. Haven't been there. I kind of think it might be roughly maybe three or four feet long and three or four feet deep. Now, why would the shepherd take the sheep down this path? There's no choice because it's a narrow gorge they're walking through. They have to jump that hole. That would be hard enough for us to jump, but it's harder for a four-footed animal. But they do it. Why do they do it? What would give them the courage to do it? The shepherd. The shepherd stands on the far end of this and encourages them with the assurance that he's there with his outreached arm. He'll take care of them. Jump, jump. And they do it because they trust their shepherd. It's a leap of faith. Do you trust your shepherd that much to make a leap of faith in the darkness? They do. Does a sheep ever fall? Yeah, once in a while they do. But very quickly with his rod, his staff, he gets them out. You know, one of those pieces of equipment has a curve on the end. And with that, he can reach under, depending on the weight of the sheep, it will either be reaching under its tummy or its neck to lift it out. He doesn't leave them there. And that's why it says thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me and they get me out too. And so, oh, there's something interesting about that. They said, should you ever visit the Valley of the Shadow of Death as a tourist, you would see on the far end of that hole, embedded deeply in the stone, are the footprints of shepherds who stood there century after century persuading the sheep to come forward. You know, we often have our own valley of the shadow of death where we might feel threatened in a dark moment. So let me tell you of a Christian scientist who had such an experience. His name is Justin, and he's my daughter Heidi's husband. Heidi now has all grown up, and she had a job at Sony Pictures in Hollywood, but she had resigned to take care of the baby, so they'd had a little farewell party for her. But Justin couldn't stay there with the baby very long. Babies don't stay at parties very long, happily. They had parked uh, in, in Los Angeles in kind of a, uh, let's just say, uh, a shadier part of Los Angeles, a gang-infested part of Los Angeles, let's just say it. And they had to walk a distance through an area to get to the parking lot. So Justin's hurrying along as fast as he can when he stopped by a red light, a stop sign a stoplight, and a gang kind of surrounds him as he's standing there, and he prays for safety, okay? It's an interesting story because um, he said as he was standing there, he was aware that probably the gang, probably the leader was right behind him, he wasn't sure, and um, he heard a strange sound. It was the, the sound of the baby who was laughing smiling, cooing. It was kind of different. When the light turned green, and it would have been the time to then all of them be moved together somewhere, instead, this man who we assumed was the head of the gang leaned over and whispered in Justin's ear, dude, that was one cool baby. And so here we, he can be as obvious as a, crossing a dangerous part of a town to get home your protection might be as subtle as making a quantum leap into a new profession, a new venture, or maybe you've made a leap and gotten stuck in a dark gully because you've fallen down into your own particular valley of the shadow of death, but he'll pull you out. And remember, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They pull me out too. They pull me out when I need pulling, not after I've learned my lesson, not after I've been in that pit long enough to scare me, not when the shepherd gets good and ready, but when I fall. 
Can you imagine that shepherd looking into the gully at the sheep and saying, hey there, sheep, you really blew it when you took a wrong step there, so I'm going to let you cool your heels down there for a little while. You've got lessons to learn. You're going to learn a lot down there, and you'll, you'll come back a couple of months. Uh, I'll come back and see if you're, if you're okay, and if you watch your footing better from then, I don't think so. He just reaches down with his rod, and he pulls you out. The rod and the staff are not meant to punish, but to comfort. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The story I was going to share with you of protection involved a Christian scientist who lives in Wichita, Kansas. She said for some 20 years she had had her home protected by a security system. The security company always sent out one of their key people to take care of her. She said, I can't tell you how many times I held the flashlight for him in a dark basement while he made absolutely sure that that security system was perfect and I was protected. And um, you can imagine her concern one night when she turned on the news. Then they said, we have just captured BTK. A serial killer. We've heard a lot about a serial killer here recently, and I actually heard this man's name mentioned on the news uh, earlier today. He was a serial killer in Wichita, Kansas. B T K. Bind, torture, kill. Seven or oh, ten women, ten women. He was the one who had taken care of her all those years. Such a kind gentleman. He prepareth a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Why would, why would a sheep have an enemy for heaven's sake? That's ridiculous. No, it isn't. You know what the enemy is that they were referring to? Poison. Poisonous plants. They say that there are plants in those meadows that are so poisonous that should a sheep inadvertently eat one, they probably wouldn't live over a maximum of two hours. The sheep have no clue as to what's poisonous, but the shepherd does. And so the shepherd goes ahead early in the morning and picks out all the poisonous plants and hides them under rocks. And then he can call the sheep in and they can dine in the presence of the enemy. How many times have we been protected, fellow sheep, without even being aware of it? Once we were made aware of it, often you're not. But uh, we had taken a group of our Sunday school students, about 20 teenagers, to uh, Canada on a hosteling trip. And when we got back, the kids said, we're so excited to be together again. Can we have a picnic and spend the night at your house? So, of course, we were going to do that. And the uh, kids had a plan, and they were so excited about it. And they were going to come at 6 o'clock, and at about 5.55, the sirens went off, the, the police, the fire department were there at the bottom. We lived in the Sierra Madre Mountains. They were at the bottom of the entrance to our place. And they said, road cut off. We've got a tremendous thunderstorm here. We can't control it. No one passes. The kids were devastated. They called. They said, wait a minute. Why does this happen to us? We were really good kids. How do, why? I said, I don't know. But you know, some, and you may never know why. But isn't it good to know that, that somehow can you just trust that God is protecting you? They said, that sounds like Sunday school talk. I said, it is Sunday school talk, okay? But God is protecting us, and we may never know how or why. But don't be angry with God for the storm. We'll have another picnic another day. The next morning, when the storm was all over, the man who uh, was our gardener knocked on the door, and he said, I want to show you something. He um, showed us the deck of our house. Uh, he said, this was where the girls were going to be sleeping. He said, I found seven rattlesnakes on it last night. I told the girls about it. I said, you know, as, you, as years go by, you won't always find the snakes, the rattlesnakes. But can you, can you trust that, as the hymn says, year by year thy hand hath brought us on through dangers oft unknown? The shepherd protects the sheep from the wolves, too. I was talking about the wolves that attack the sheep while speaking in Europe once, and an English-speaking German lady came up to me afterward and asked if I knew how sheep 
could protect themselves from wolves. And it was an interesting story. She said, when a wolf attacks a sheep, the shepherd is well aware of it. He immediately summons the rest of the sheep. Remember, they always come. They know their shepherd's voice. They know what to do. They've been trying. They see what's happening. The wolf and the sheep. They form a circle around the wolf and the sheep. And then they tighten it and tighten it and tighten it until she said they smush the wolf. It helps when we stick together, doesn't it, to smush the wolf? Each of us here, each of us, all of you listening to this, watching this at this moment, we all have one thing in common. We just heard a talk in the 23rd Psalm. Something has brought you here. May we assume that whether that's something or someone came in the guise of a friend or a relative or an email invitation or whatever, that it was, maybe it was really the shepherd leading you. And having led you, can we then go forward to trust that there are enough of us here, even though you don't know who is here or where they are, to make a difference in the problems facing us? That there are enough sheep here to smush any wolf which would attack your town, your nation, your family, your health, your income? Are you seeing that there is no problem which God cannot help you with? No problem too big, no problem too little, too trivial, too personal? You can live where you are, in the midst of whatever dangers your present situation might include, in safety. Your shepherd knows the dangers and protects you from them. You don't have to move to be safe. If a baby's smile can divert a gang, think what power God's love for each of us has. The sheep didn't have to leave their pasture to eat. You can not only survive, but thrive right where you are. And by the way, when the newscaster speaks of being ready for the big one, will you remember that the biggest one is more than ready for it? He anointeth my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Now we come to the close of the day, the last scene. At the door of the sheepfold, the shepherd stands and the, the rotting of the sheep takes place. The shepherd turns in such a way as to let the sheep pass under his rod as they go in. With his rod, he, he holds back the sheep while he looks them over one by one as they go into the fold. He has his horn filled with olive oil and his, his cedar tar, and, and with them he, he anoints a bruised knee or a side scratched by thorns. It isn't meant to heal anything, but to soothe, to comfort, to let the sheep know he cares. Even the sheep who may not be injured, but simply exhausted, worn down, worn out, gets his face and head bathed in oil. And then the shepherd takes a large two-handled cup, dips it brimming filled with water, and lets the sheep drink. Not a scrimpy serving. Why, sometimes the cup even runs over. So when I'm injured and worn out and hurting, is there still a shepherd to take care of me? Is there still a shepherd who knows my needs? Who pulls me aside from the flock and anoints my head with oil? Or is all the story of long ago and far away? Well, I've got good news for you. The shepherd is still here. The shepherd is still watching over the flock. He's still watching over you. And when you're bruised and hurting and tired, the cup, it's still there. But what if you were to leave this talk seeing but uh, one man, the good man of God's creating, on the sidewalk, on the highway, in the mirror? You see, that's how Christian scientists are taught to see man. And that's the viewpoint that makes the difference. It isn't blind faith. We're not into faith healing. This science is no more mere faith healing or positive thinking than mathematics is. It's two things. It's Christian and it's science. It's based on the teachings, the healings of Christ Jesus, as recorded in the King James Version of the Bible. And it's a science. Do you know the definition of a Christian, by the way? According to Webster, it's one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. 
By the way, it is not defined as one who believes Jesus is God. And the definition of a science, a branch of systematized knowledge. So Christian science is something you can get your hands on and study. It allows you a format for working out your problems. Of course, it demands faith, but it demands understanding as well. Our textbook, Science and Health, doesn't take the place of the Bible. Nothing will ever take the place of the Bible. It's a key to the Bible. It unlocks its deeper meanings. It, it makes it applicable today. You may find in your study of it that it's uh, light years ahead of the world. While it builds on the teachings of a man who lived over 2,000 years ago. It teaches that man is good, not evil. That God is an ever-present help, not a distant being. That with God all things are possible, and then shows how and why that is. We don't belittle or refuse human help. We just trust God more. Does that make sense to you? When that cup runs over, why would you go elsewhere for a drink? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, not maybe, not hopefully, not doubtfully, surely. Goodness and mercy, not hassles and weakness and age, but all good will follow me all the days of my life, all the days. Not just the young days, all the days. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not drop in from time to time, but dwell there. Stay there. Your shepherd loves you so much. And strange as it may sound, I hope you'll leave this program feeling a little sheepish, more willing to trust your shepherd's tender, loving care for you. In closing... May I repeat, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My prayer is that somewhere... Within the confines of the 23rd Psalm, you've found an answer to a problem. Thank you. <laughs>